Well, hello there and welcome back. Brand new week on the Bet US College Basketball Show. I am the somewhat capable host, TJ Reeves. It is like the Vegas hangover edition, or is it the Vegas holdover edition of the program on a Monday as the field of 68 is now down to 16 teams. Hello, Matt Cox. Hello, Corby Craig. Both of you have been in the desert in Sin City and have lived to tell about it. And you are here on Bet US TV. Good to have you back. Matty Cox. Good to see your smiling face. How are things on a Monday as we now know uh, that all the number one seeds and all the number two seeds made it through the first weekend? That is highly unusual. Matt, good to be with you. Your thoughts uh, here on a Monday? I'm doing good, TJ. My voice is not as good, uh, nor are any underdog backers. Um, favorites for context. Top three seeds specifically, TJ. 16-4 and four against the spread. 19-1 and one outright. 16 and four against the spread. Uh, it's been very, very chalky. I guess fun if you're a front runner, not as fun if you're a dog barker, unless, of course, you're Oakland and a Jack Golke super fan, which, of course, everyone is at this point. Oh, wow. What I mean, what a phenomenal series of games. Uh, when you're talking about the Oakland NC State game and overtime, the double overtime Creighton Oregon game, the epic. I mean, Houston and AM have hated each other. Yep in football and basketball for 75 years. And uh, what an epic game Sunday night in Memphis that Houston eventually survived and won uh, in overtime, 195. Corby Craig, you are with us as well. We take a look at our records. We're still hovering around 500. Good proof of life on you. However, you have returned from the desert a little short-handed. Uh, are, we are we bemoaning or praising the fact that when you went through airport security, you left your laptop, but apparently... The government, Homeland Security, and TSA has your laptop, is what you were telling me just before the show began. Yeah, Matt seems to have made it out alive and uh, looking good. You know, we like to see that sometimes. But my my successes in Vegas were much different. Left in TSA on a <laughs> on a red eye out of there, and here we are. But we made it. I uh, I had a few people from the show who said they watched the show come up to me and and just say hey, and that was awesome in Vegas. Cool. Um, one of which I I had our Uber driver had just gotten pulled over, so I uh, I had to make him like, <laughs> hey, I, I can't talk, but I appreciate it. So it was um it was a trip, but we're here. My Blazers, you know, we had a shot, we had wow. a shot at the very last seconds, couldn't get it done, but uh, overall a really fun March Madness. Hey, they and again, covered, they did cover, they did cover, and you guys were on it. I mean, Matt Cox, you've only played the live button once. That was earlier in the week. We goaded you into it because you weren't on the show the rest of the week, and you hit it with UAB in the opening round with San Diego State. And Corby, I you were also on the one and zero record. You line. should because uh, I misfired a couple of times. Nadu hit several. He hit like two or three live buttons on the Saturday show. Uh, so we had some fun with that, and we're going to look ahead, obviously, on this show today, but not to get into specific handicaps. Just make some. Uh, make some comments on the different regions. We'll do that. Thank you for finding us. Thank you, and hit the like button, and make sure you're subscribed. And, guys, we're going to celebrate here for a second. Kevin, get the number one fingers up once again. 10,000 subscribers. We got there. Not right at the start of March Madness, but I'm going to count it anyway. The first weekend, we got 10,000 subs. Great stuff. Hit subscribe. We're here the rest of this week. We're here the week of the Final Four. I'll be live in uh, Glendale, Arizona. Matty, I don't know if you're out there live again this year. I will see you down there, we'll, boss. Yes, we sir. will be hanging out in the desert. We'll, we'll be live on BetUS TV Thursday, Friday, Monday from the Final Four. Cannot wait for that. Again, if you're subscribed, you'll get the automatic reminder. By the way, Monday through Friday at 11, massive audience. Biggest show of the year, not surprising, was Saturday. This Saturday, 10 a.m., let's try to break that record. 10 a.m. Eastern Time on Saturday on BetUS TV. Uh, again, we'll get to some live Q&A, some interaction. There are lines out already for the for the Sweet 16 games. we got to have something to talk about as well for Tuesday and for Wednesday before we get to Thursday and Friday in the four different sites, Boston, Detroit, Los Angeles, and Dallas. Uh, guys, why don't we take a look at the defending champs in the East bracket, UConn. UConn emerges as the number one seed, having blasted uh, Northwestern in a game that really wasn't that close. So they will now play San Diego State that comes out of Spokane, still in the East bracket, to play them in Boston. Bottom of that draw is Iowa State and Illinois. Corby, begin a thought or two on what we saw, and these are the four teams left in the East, about to play in Beantown. Yeah, the Yale game was kind of a disappointment yesterday, but uh, overall, I feel like this has kind of been the sentiment 
I, I hear UConn kind of chirping on the idea that they think that uh, they got the hardest road possible. And, and I understand where people are coming from, but uh, it, Auburn being a four is the only one I would really agree with. I, I still think this Iowa State team has pieces they can lose to. And uh, I think this Illinois matchup is going to be a tough one for them. We see Iowa State not scoring a lot of points, but a uh, defensive nightmare for most teams. And Illinois, if they have the ability to hit shots, feel like that's a pretty good spot to be in. So I, I still like the bottom side of that bracket. I think Illinois has a chance there. And if they face UConn, they'll, they'll be a pretty good matchup. But overall, UConn has looked dominant at this point as one of the guys that just doesn't really want to see UConn win. It's, it, it's rough. It's rough to be in that camp right now because uh, they do look as dominant as they have in quite some time. San Diego State, I thought the Blazers played good and they, they could have won that game outright, but then they come back to a Yale performance where uh, they just show they're the more talented team. They they are big boys, and uh, even UAB is struggling with that. So they look good. Are they big enough to step up to the task of UConn? We've seen it uh, last year, basically. This San Diego seat team kind of press um, the narrative that they weren't, and I don't think that they can here, but um, it should be a fun Sweet 16. Matty Cox, thoughts on what we see there on the East off the weekend. Again, we'll handicap the matchups themselves later in the week. These games uh, will be coming on Thursday in Boston. Uh, thoughts, Matty Cox? Yeah, I mean, UConn's just a different level right now. Right? I mean, I think they we came into this tournament thinking it was a UConn, Houston, Purdue, three-horse race, with all due respect to UNC. But there was a very clear top three. But now I feel like UConn is just so obviously the best team even with Purdue and that awesome one they had yesterday, I just think UConn's been more impressive given who they've played and the way in which they've just demolished teams, just operating on full cylinder on, on all cylinders right now. But Illinois, I, if there's a team that can maybe trip up UConn before they get to the Final Four and, and, and march onto the podium for a second straight season, I think Illinois has got the horses to do it. Matchup-wise, yeah, we'll get into that later in the week, but I do think they have the prerequisite talent and uh, just general, you know, firepower, ammunition, if you will, to to take down the Huskies. And there, there are two or three different teams that have this, and Illinois has it with Terrence Shannon, a guy that can take the game over, suddenly get you five, six, eight points in the clutch that you need, have a 35-point game if you need it. I still favor UConn to come out of there. I have them in every bracket winning the whole thing. But I'm with you that Illinois – could be the team that could screw that up in Boston if it comes to it. Illinois has got to get by Iowa State first. So uh, we'll come on. We'll back. We'll come back on camera here for just a second and finish up uh, on this. We've not had a repeat uh, champion uh, in college basketball going back to the Florida 06-07 teams. It is tough to repeat, and it is four more steps for UConn to repeat. But they look the part, gentlemen. Just one more time on UConn right now, kind of the futures market. You're not going to get a very good value, but Corby, uh, on as far as looking the part, UConn looks the part real quick. Yeah, they look the part. They, I would say their next few tests aren't really that hard either. Um, so I, Illinois could be an interesting matchup. I would say obviously it could be an interesting matchup. It's all relative, but uh, I definitely think there are harder roads to face. And and so I don't worry about them getting very deep. So futures-wise, you're not going to get a good price to market at all. Um, I think if you like UConn, you should have taken them in November, basically. I couldn't even get good prices in January, but... This is the front runner. I still really like this Houston team, but we'll get into that later. Matty Cox, final thought just on UConn looking the part as perhaps a repeat. We don't know. Yeah, two to one is their current uh, two, one and a half to one, two and a half to one. Two to one is their average, looks like, um, price to win the tournament at this point. So honestly, <laughs> that feels like a pretty good price, but you run the numbers mathematically to go four more games. Um, it, it's actually not. It, so I think you got to pick your spots if you're going to bet UConn the rest of the way. If you are a UConn, uh, if you wanted UConn, I think you missed your your window to get a really good value. But I still, gut tells me they are the best team, and I just don't see them losing. I really don't. Corby taking some hits in the live chat right now about his Baylor yeah, futures we'll plays. Get... Uh, well, why don't we get to it now? Why don't we go to the West bracket? Let's go to the West bracket where North Carolina, Alabama, Arizona, and Clemson emerge. Full disclosure, the host thought New Mexico was going to be in this group in the Sweet 16. Clemson beat them. Clemson beat Baylor. Arizona moved through on the on the bottom of the draw. And then North Carolina uh, took care of Michigan State Saturday night. And then how about the battle with Alabama and Grand Canyon? As physical a college basketball NCAA tournament game as you're going to see Man, bodies everywhere, fouls everywhere. Grand Canyon had the lead late, and then Alabama closed them out. All right, uh, Matt, begin the thoughts on the West bracket here. Clemson's the surprise team. There was only one 
lower seeded team on Sunday that won the game out of the eight games. That was Clemson beating Baylor. Thoughts, Matt? Yeah, it's the most wide open by far. And I think we thought that going in because North Carolina was arguably uh, or most agreed that they were the weakest one seed. They've looked really good, though, themselves. And Michigan State, you know, get a, a good you know, 15, 20 minutes there, but then the Tar Heels just wore on them. They were just the better team. And I thought they out-defended Michigan State, who had been playing excellent defense coming in. Uh, I kind of think they're my, they might be a team that people have, you know, as a one seed, it's hard to say you're underrated or being slept on, but it feels like they aren't getting the respect of the other three, and they're certainly playing at that tier. I, I do like Alabama more than most, though. Their defense, as crazy and sporadic and helter-skelter as that game was, I think they showed they have a defensive backbone when they need it. That'll help, obviously, against UNC. It'll help the rest of the way. But Alabama, with their offense, and then with some defensive upside, I mean, I think they could easily win this this bracket. But look at Clemson against Arizona at the bottom half here. Arizona against teams that execute, while they have been better this season against those types of teams, and I think Tommy Lloyd's really made a conscious effort to retool his roster and his team to be less, um, you know, matchup-based and, and less bullet less uh, bulletproof against what they bring in their transition. We saw it against Dayton, right? They out-executed Dayton, just outplayed Dayton. Clemson can really execute, and they've been playing excellent basketball lately. Sort of the most surprising sixth seed in Sweet 16, it feels like, in years. So that's I mean, both those matchups are fascinating. I really think any team comes out of this. I was actually looking at Clemson as a long-shot um, bracket West winner here um, just because I, I think people still haven't taken them seriously, and they know UNC if they play them in the regional final very well, obviously. I think mm-hmm. they do match up well with Arizona. Like I said, Arizona matches up better than they used to uh, last year specifically, but I still think Clemson has a good matchup. Um, you know, if they can keep Arizona in the half court, they have a chance there. What do we keep talking about? Death in March, brick free throws, brick free throws. Corby, that's where your Baylor future went down with missed free throws. But, I mean, Grand Canyon missed a ton of free throws, two of 20 also from three-point range. You're not going to advance. Uh, when you're doing it. Texas A&M, I know they got the game into overtime on the last second three, but they built a condominium in Memphis with all the missed free throws uh, in that game. Back to Clemson, uh, they obviously get the two wins. They are the second biggest underdog on BetUS right now in terms of the game matchups, getting seven and a half with Arizona for whatever it's worth. All right, Corby, your thoughts just real quick on those four teams remaining in the West. Yeah, first off, shout out to Clemson. Um, it, it's funny. I, I've learned from this season in particular, I just won't post about futures because, like, I mean, this Baylor future, I get 40 DMs when they lost last night. Uh, it was <laughs> an implied, it was a, an implied 2% chance that that would win. I was asked what the best future was at that time, and I said Baylor. But uh, I, I still like the Bears. So, yeah, I mean, you got the best player on the court to the free throw line to tie the game to go to overtime, and he misses both. So, uh, struggle. But, listen, if you go back to the November, I think, eighth show maybe november 5th i said i like clemson 150 to 1 to win the national championship so i still have that ticket and you have beat one arizona of those here, you do have yeah, one of those interesting i do have one and if uh if they can beat arizona i'll start hedging out but i do think arizona is pretty tough matchup for them but this is a clemson team who we don't talk about enough they have, i mean they have a point guard who has played basically 10 years at syracuse he is 112 of 118 from the free throw line this year always a nice backbone to have P.J. Hall, just a dominant center. Like They have all the pieces. Also, if you watch that Baylor game, the entire offense was just rub screens. They have Draymond Green's special rub screen, and the, it's, it's impossible to stop. So it's it's dependent on the referee. Um, I don't know how any team can stop a rub screen with Joseph Girard and P.J. Hall. But uh, Alabama's looked decent. I do agree with Matt. Their defense looked a little better than I expected them to, even though uh, Grand Canyon kind of shot themselves in the foot. I do think Alabama was making the necessary switches I just wonder if North Carolina has enough talent. They both want to play kind of the same speed. Uh, North Carolina, I would say, has better players throughout. And so I'd be curious where that game is. The one that really interests me is Arizona-Clemson here. I think Clemson has the pieces to at least keep this game close. And like we said, uh, if this game is close and somehow Clemson is up with three minutes left, it's really hard to get into the foul game. Um, Chase Hunter's a really good free throw shooter. I think I saw 86% for the year. And so you just there's no right piece to foul. Um, and, and you can get some trouble. Do I think they, they win? Probably not, but I do think they cover that seven and a half. We'll come back on camera here. Good stuff there, Kevin, and our crew behind the scenes showing you the West Bracket in Los Angeles. And again, that's coming Thursday night uh, for those teams and that matchup. Uh, again, for uh, Clemson, they are part of four ACC teams that made the Sweet 16. For all of the talk of the Big 12, only two of them got through. That is uh, what Houston and Iowa State were the only two, and Houston barely 
uh, that got through four ACC teams. All three Big East teams, by the way, got through into the Sweet 16. Again, thank you for finding us. Hit the like button. We're kind of going over the weekend, looking ahead a little bit. You'll get more specific handicapping on the uh, Sweet 16 games as the week goes on. There will also be some NIT talk as the week goes on, but we're kind of going broader big picture here on bet us tv hit that like button make sure you're subscribed we're here at 11 a.m all week saturday at 10 a.m we see you there dave uh damien that they have yeah they just coincidentally have those north carolina arizona uh, uh teams in the uh, in the same bracket for the possible caleb love against his old school that he won the national title with again you had to win three games to get there but it is interesting that that would be your elite eight game if it comes to it you got one more step uh, for that, let's move on. Let's go to the Midwest bracket. We have not really talked about Purdue and Tennessee, what really at all, Creighton, Gonzaga, yet off the weekend. So, Kevin, let's take a look at the Midwest bracket, which is now uh, filtered to Detroit. These are games uh, that will be coming up on Friday night. Purdue, very impressive with Utah State, bash them. Gonzaga's second half with Kansas, guys, as good as any half maybe that anybody's played in the first two games of the tournament. Creighton had to survive that tremendous double overtime uh, struggle with Oregon. They did survive, and Tennessee looked good. Nadu and I were going back and forth on the Saturday show. He was on the Texas side. I was on the Tennessee side. I was good, as we like to say, until I wasn't good. Texas got it within three. Tennessee hit the free throws. Connect hasn't played a great game in either one of the first two games. All right, Matt Cox, begin with a thought or two on the Midwest bracket in Detroit here, what we saw off the weekend as well. You know, it's funny. All of the teams that are here are all really good teams, no question. Um, you could argue it's the best uh, foursome, top to bottom. You know, no real holes in this in this group. But at this point, we probably should respect Clemson and NC State and not consider them, you know, flukes or anything. However, uh, what I'm concerned about is, or what's what I'm looking to handicap is the the who they played to get here and and what they did in those games. Right? Purdue played a Utah State team that, uh, by all accounts, was kind of walking on eggshells with their head coach, already eyeing some other opportunities. And I, I just don't think they were ready. Uh, they, that was a white flag, we're done with the season type effort. I know Purdue was great, but I think Utah State helped them look very good. I'll say that. Uh, Creighton, Oregon. Uh, Oregon should have probably won that game. Uh, terrible loss for Oregon backers in that one. And I know Creighton, Here we go again, if I can interject. I mean, Dante oh, yeah. at the foul line with, yep. what, a four-point lead. Front end of the one-and-one. One. He bricks the front end of the one-and-one. One. They go down and get a two. They get another stop. They go down and tie the game. Missed free throws. Missed free throws, but give Creighton the credit. Creighton out-battled them and got yep. through now to play Tennessee. Yeah, and I, I just think to play, to to beat really good teams, Creighton needs to make shots. I don't think they have uh, as much diversity in how they beat you. So that, that, that gives me some pause with Creighton. I can kind of saw that show up against Oregon. And then finally, Tennessee... They won, did not cover against Texas. I thought that game could have gone either way as well. We've seen some of Tennessee's offensive lulls show up in spurts. Again, I'm kind of nitpicking through all four of these, but I think for what looks like a very good uh, you know, foursome, there are some holes. The one I do like, though, is Gonzaga, who did play a really battered and bruised Kansas team, no question. But they look the part the most to me from a value perspective, right? Like, I know Purdue is probably the better team. You know, Tennessee is probably the better team. Creighton right there. But I, I think from a value perspective, you're looking to a better region winner, or look for like a long shot to come out of the Midwest, longer shot, I should say. Uh, I like the Zags. I think they've just been continuously discounted. The rotation's tight, but their guards are really good. And I like those two guards um, almost as much as I like any of the, the the guard tandems here in this region, save maybe Tennessee with Dalton Connect. But I, I like the Zags. It feels like they had that old Cinderella mantra before they uh, became a West Coast juggernaut the last decade. Corby Craig, that's a perfect segue. You've been talking about Gonzaga for weeks, especially after that win at Kentucky. They then close out with a win at St. Mary's, even though they didn't beat St. Mary's in the championship game of the WCC tournament. Man, they were impressive uh, in both games with McNeese, and then that second half just pummeling Kansas. At one point, I think it was a 20-2 to run early on in the second half. They've looked good. Now they go up against Purdue. Thoughts on Gonzaga? Thoughts on what's left there in the Midwest? Yeah, if we want to talk about futures, I uh, posted a 80 to one Gonzaga future. Whenever they, um, we were we were debating on if they were in the tournament, I said there's no way they're not in the tournament. The main thing here, and I, I fully agree with Matt, is 
you have to look at like who have they played recently, less of a like a skill basis, more of a scheme basis. Because Zach had just played Hunter Dickinson without McCuller. This is a big man who they've struggled with over the course of the year. They've struggled with big men. Like we saw him play UConn. I think Klingon had 35. We saw him play Purdue already once this year. And uh, Edie had, I think, 27. I don't have the number in front of me. But we saw Hunter Dickinson really struggle to get shots yesterday. Am I saying that he is either of those guys? I'm not. He went four for 11. He ended up shooting a couple threes, hitting a couple threes. And listen, if <laughs> if Zach Eady hits some threes, Purdue wins this game. Uh, I don't imagine that he's going to be attempting that. Zach Eady has had the benefit of the doubt if you watch that Utah State game. I do agree Utah State kind of, they were like, okay, it was, it was fun. But he had 15 rebounds in the first half, I believe. I could be wrong about that number. But it mm-hmm. was something like, there was a foul at one point where uh, Great Osborne had one arm, the guard had the other arm, Zach Eady had the ball, and he, he still <laughs> went up and, and did a layup. And it's like, that's who they've yep. been playing. They're playing Gonzaga now. In their last matchup, they lost by 10, and people will look at that as reference. But Gonzaga also played a completely different lineup, a lineup which had Huff in, and Huff is a three-point shooting big man, not a a guy who can guard Zach Eady at all. And so I think their lineup now looks better. Am I saying they win this game outright? Probably not. You're getting five. Uh, but I do think that there is some underlying value in backing the Zags there has been for quite some time. We see them playing Really good basketball. My only worry is they, it just feels, I don't know if you agree, Matt, but it feels like they start slow in the first half. Like we even saw a San Francisco game that was tied yeah. at halftime and they won by 30. And it's like, you're not going to be able to do that versus uh, Zach Eady led team. Zach Eady can score 20 in the first half by himself if you sleep. Just the nature of the beast. Um, but I do think the Zags have a chance there. I agree. I mean, just look at the, um, they played, right, in Maui. We talked about, you know, looking at instances mm-hmm. where you have these, situations where teams have already played each other. And I think the fact you've already seen Edie before, you're not going to get caught off guard by what he brings, right? They already have a scout report in their back pocket. I know they lost that game by 10, but they were up 10 themselves in the first half. They were six of 32 from three were the Zags in that game, 18%. I mean, they make three more threes and this game's a whole different type of, you know, that, that, that could have easily gone the Zags way. Um, and so I like that they, that they had success in part in that first game they're playing better, I'd argue, at now than they were at that time. So you're effectively getting the same price that you got back in November with, in my opinion, a better Zags team who proved they could hang with Purdue in that matchup, right, with their size. So I do like, I like the Zags here. I think there's some value at five, not a ton. I mean, it's March 25th. You're not going to find any major mispricing. True. Right? But so you kind of have to dig to level three, four derivative type of angles to, to really find, to mine for value. But uh, I, I like kind of looking at that angle and see some value here on the Zags in a five-point spread. You mentioned Maui, and I believe it's correct. They beat Gonzaga in Maui, they beat Tennessee in Maui, and they would be slated to potentially, if there's an upset, play Marquette All in the Final yep, Four, right? right? Who they also beat in Maui. It's like back to the future Twilight Zone. Do, 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 that they got to play the same teams again here in the postseason that they played in November. Uh, we'll see. We'll see if it all comes to that. Great conversation there on the Midwest. we got one more bracket to talk about. We'll get to some live Q&A. Again, there's not specific handicapping plays yet. Cool it, peeps. Cool it, savages. The plays are coming later in the week. we got to have something to talk about Tuesday, Wednesday on the show, except pace yourselves. Pace yourselves. The boys have been in Vegas. They don't need to go hardcore right now on Monday when we still got days, Thank you. plural, to talk about this stuff. Uh, let's continue. South bracket. My Lord. Houston, Texas A&M. By the hair of their chinny chin chin. A lot of people have Houston in the championship game. A lot of people in their brackets have Houston winning the whole thing. They were almost bye-bye. However, they are still alive. Duke, who I have loved since we saw the bracket last Sunday night, eight nights ago. I have loved them to come out of the South and to beat Houston. What do I know? I have it in every bracket. We shall see. And then uh, NC State, which everybody had. Uh, for the Sweet 16, team that was not even in the tournament. Had they not won the ACC title game with North Carolina nine nights ago, they're not even in this tournament. Now they're in the Sweet 16 uh, with a great win over Oakland. Marquette looked good early Sunday against Colorado. That's me saying that. Matty Cox, begin with a little bit on the South, uh, what we saw out of this weekend, and now those two matchups coming in Dallas. It's entirely possible Jared McCain's the best player in this tournament, not named Zach Eady. He's been an absolute star. Uh, I think when you have a guy going like he's going, Duke, you're right, can beat anybody. And we've, we've always known they had the talent. I think the question with Duke's been their toughness, and that's where they've been exposed in certain spots this season, especially up front where they don't really have a true, legit five-man. Um, and you play Houston, and they got a bunch of those guys. And I know they're not all like seven foot, but but the Houston 
frontline fortress is imposing. You saw those athletes flying around last night against AM, who has plenty of athletes athletes themselves. Duke gets fortunate though here because the the injuries for Houston are starting to mount. And I think you're seeing some of the wear and tear uh and some of the depth issues compounded by the loss of Jojo Tugler. They still have Francis and they still have um Roberts, but but neither are hundred percent right now. And so if you're Duke, at least you're catching a brittle front line but I still think Duke's going to have issues. And we saw this against Arizona in the matchup in the non-conference way back in November. Um, it, it's it's just reared its ugly head against big, powerful front lines. Wake got him pretty good. North Carolina got him with some physicality up front. I do agree with you, TJ. I think Duke's playing really well. And against any other team, I'd be riding the, the wave. I just worry that they hit a kryptonite spot here with what Houston can bring to bear. Again, that's assuming those front line guys are all going to be 100% ineffective. And there were some times last night where they were not, and that's where a and took advantage, just kept coming at him, kept coming at him, and almost got him to crack, but it just was too, uh, you know, Jamal Shedd was eventually too much in the end. He's just incredible. And they had all the foul outs, too, where you had the, the reserve player Elvin step to the foul line. Uh, who in the world would have thought he's at the line in overtime to stay alive in the season and miss the first and I'm, I'm kind of like, man, is he going to brick both of these and give AM the chance to tie the game? He did make the second, and they held him off with some late free throws. Did Houston with Texas AM late night Sunday. All right, Corby, thoughts, including NC State, which we have probably not talked enough about. Uh, what a phenomenal win over Oakland in the overtime game. First of all, we haven't discussed this. Corby, right or wrong, should Oakland have gotten one more chance with a second and a half left? Was that ball not off the pinky finger? Of the uh, of the NC State uh, player, where Oakland should have gotten one more chance tie game at the end of regulation, or are you fine with leaving the call as it was, and eventually the Wolfpack wins in overtime? Yeah, I don't know. The referees had a good look at it. I trust that they were right. Uh, I mean, I would have probably said Oakland, but you know, it's over. It happened. You had a you had five more minutes to take your shot. He almost hit the uh, he almost hit the three quarter court shot, but uh, correct. No, they had the shot, and there there were there as every high school coach ever has said. There are things that you can blame way more than the referee call with 1.2 seconds. I'm sure somebody missed a free throw. Somebody made a defense. Well, first of all, blunder. fundamentally, if I can interrupt, it's a bad pass. It's a terrible pass. And so the only bailout was the pinky finger that maybe touched the ball because that was just awful that they didn't even get a shot there with the bad pass. So you're right. Uh, what a great story. But again, back back to the Wolfpack. I didn't mean to sidestep you uh, or sidetrack you. DJ Burns has been tremendous. Um, NC State back in the Sweet 16. They've only they've only been in the Sweet 16, I think, three times uh, in about the last 25 years. Thoughts on NC State matching up with Marquette, as it turns out? Yeah, I think it's an interesting spot for NC State. I mean, we've seen them play, what, seven games in 11 days. So now they get a little bit of a break, a breather for the first time. And I don't know, do you want that at this point? Like, uh, maybe good point. <laughs> keep it going while it's hot. Like, uh, it sounds nice. It sounds good to be able to take a break. We've seen DJ Horn kind of been just dead on the floor every single time he falls down and take a little extra breather if he has the ability to. But, um, man, I, I mean, 7 and 11, go ahead and make it 8 and 12 if you can. It's, it's a tough matchup versus Marquette. I do think that they have the pieces. Kolek's been great. I still – I might just be overthinking this, but I still think that he has something wrong with him in the oblique. Like, it seems like he's making his passes a little lower – in his arm side, obviously he's playing great, uh, but it, it, he hasn't been strained or, or battle tested too much. Like if you watch that first game, he's just throwing weird passes, like from a weird arm slot. And uh, I'm probably overthinking it. I had Western Kentucky money line, and in the first half, I just looked absolutely like I was Nostradamus yep. himself. And then uh, they don't even cover the game, so uh, who knows? As we like to from, say, you were great until you weren't. Yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so we want we, we want to bring up Bailey Future. So let's do futures one more time. Nadu and I preseason took Houston 20 to one and uh, feel great there. I, I thought AM was their matchup that they were really going to struggle with. I love Wade Taylor. I, I wish he would have had a good game. He played awful last night. Um, and, and Houston's uh, just fun to watch 21. I feel great there. I also have some Duke 30 to one that we talked about on the show, but um, that's going to be a good matchup. I, I think Duke has the pieces to again, give Houston a re- like UConn wants to complain and say that the, the, in, the, the fundamentals of the bracket kind of led to them losing I mean, Houston had to play A and M, then Duke, now Marquette. Like they're going to have mm-hmm. uh, a really tough spot here. Uh, somebody had a great question uh, here. It is uh, Michael. Look at Michael. He says, "Hey, can you? Can somebody explain? You can put it back up, guys. Can you explain Filipowski's disappearing act on offense thus far for Duke?" 
Uh, I mean, Matt Cox, let's get into that for just a second here. He took one shot, Uno, in the Vermont game and didn't do a whole lot. And uh, one of my colleagues who was there at the Barclays Center, one of my media colleagues, said, hey, they've adjusted his role. They're running some offense through him, but they're using him as a screener, decoy, rebounder. They're not featuring him as much. And obviously, when you're bombing in threes like they were. But what about Filipowski? I think you could make the argument he's maybe due for a breakout game. I don't know if he's going to get it against yeah. Houston, but that's a very <laughs> valid question. What's up with Filipowski? What's your theory? No, I think it's a good sign for Duke. I think it just shows that they're not as reliant on him to create and score, right? You saw Mark Mitchell step up in that game against Vermont. Duke did a nice job in both their games, um, kind of playing to, to their strengths in the matchups, right? Against Vermont, Vermont didn't really have uh, a secondary forward, uh, multiple athletes up front, and that's what Mark Mitchell really took advantage of, right? So Mark Mitchell was kind of the guy that ate in that first meeting, which was more of a defensive drag. It was a pretty ugly game, all things considered. Um, and in the second game, they got McCain going. And with McCain going the way he is right now, Roach is making shots. Proctor's kind of doing his thing, too, as sort of the the quasi-Robin, even though we all thought he'd be the All-American preseason. He's really cozy up to his role as well. Also a really good on-ball defender. Um, Phil Pouse doesn't have to do everything. I think that's great for Duke and for Filipowski, who's been, you know, Flip's been overly leaned on all season. Uh, I, I think having a few games off where he can kind of hide in the shadows and then they reemerge in a more favorable matchup will be a will go a long way. Um, the other thing, too, we saw Sean Stewart again step up last night for Duke at some key minutes off the bench. He could be a difference maker, uh, especially in this Houston matchup. They need his size and his physicality and his athleticism. However, um, you know, they will need Flip to step up. You know, if Flip's, Flip cannot stand in the back and and kind of watch the rest of the, the, the Jimmy's and Joe's do their thing. He will need to have a big game for them to continue to march on here. Love all of that. Let's get to some questions and answers from you savages. we got a few more minutes here. Uh, again, uh, no official plays on the show. But in the Q&A here for a Monday after the Sweet 16 has been set in the NCAA tournament, Easy Baby 1988 is always in here. And Easy Baby says right away, CBI games with a question mark. Yes, Easy Baby, there are CBI games. The question is, does anybody really care? Uh, Corby Craig, well, Matt Cox, anything on any of the CBI today? I, I was going to say, the better question is who's playing. And uh, you saw yesterday and, these lines <laughs> moved like crazy on the news of opt-outs and, uh, and and injuries. I'll put those in quotations. Players not playing. Uh, okay. Right. Okay. However, you saw the lines move an exorbitant amount. And I believe all four of the teams, uh, as Jordan Majeski, I'll give him credit, called attention to on Twitter. Phenomenal follow for those who don't. Uh, all of the teams who had major opt-outs and had the line move against them, they all covered. So, I think it's one of those situations where why you probably shouldn't be handicapping this stuff unless you have a really strong edge. And I think the edge can be gleaned from injuries. But we just saw yesterday four games, none of it mattered. And I think if you're overreacting, I think the market's overreacting to some of this news, TJ. So if you're getting in at the right time, you're you're going to be okay. But if you're waiting to pile on the last, you know, if you're at the back of the line getting the minus eight when they just gobble up the minus seven and the minus six, I think yesterday is a good proof point as to why you should tread lightly uh, with that approach. Did you today use the pronoun we just saw? I don't think yes. I saw those CBI games. No, I don't think I was watching that. Corby you, Craig, they're they're playing in Daytona Beach, not far from where I am, about three hours over on the other coast of Florida. They've gone to the centralized, play it on the same floor, whatever. Anything for the CBI, or shall we move on for Monday? Yeah, TJ, you, uh, you didn't watch the Chicago State team pull the upset of the year? They, uh, no. they hadn't played basketball in 38 days, came in and beat the two seed as plus 430 underdog. So, uh, and I that, my friend, day. ought to tell you exactly why you shouldn't really be watching the CBI. There you go. Yeah, yeah, I, I would agree, but I will say there's a there's a pretty good game today. Um, I will be watching because I've talked about this team on the show a million times. High Point plays Cleveland State today. That will actually be a really good basketball game. I'm curious to see the effort level of these teams. The High Point team who probably feels like they were – destined to go to March Madness and um, a Cleveland State team who you don't want to sleep on. So I, I, I lean towards high, high point there, but uh, I, I didn't bet anything. You've been all over those high point guys. And then unfortunately, uh, what was it? Longwood won that tournament, beat high point on their home floor, upset UNC Asheville, and then got annihilated by Houston. Congrats. You did win the conference title. Uh, real quick. Let's get a couple of more uh, questions in. James has got something with the coaching carousel spinning. 
He says, who's the next Louisville coach, TJ? Matty and Corby. Thoughts? Apparently, Scott Drew did not want the job. Dusty May looked at it and went, mm, Michigan. Uh, what about the Louisville job? Matt Cox. Anything? Yeah, tough spot. I think they thought they had Dusty, and I think even uh, Dusty thought he was coming there, too. It sounded like they were at the finish line, and then Dusty had a last-second change of heart. But, uh, you know, Jeff Goodman threw out a few names uh, for that job. Uh, I actually heard Shaheen Holloway's name come up, which is sort of a wild card mm. from I wouldn't think he'd leave the his East Coast roots. But um, his alma mater, right? His right, yeah. He's born and bred up there. And uh, well, what? And, let's be truthful. Can we add, get both of you comment on this? This job is not a very good job right now. Kenny Payne did an awful job. Yes, they have some NIL money, but they have a lot of uncertainty. Is the ACC going to stay intact in the as a conference? Uh, this job has disintegrated over the last year or year and a half to the point that this is you're relegated right now to looking at the second level or the third level. Corby, a thought? Yeah, and they're losing Sky Clark. I saw he went to the portal. So um, I agree. When I saw May was considering them over Michigan, I was like, this is, uh, I am not saying Michigan's a great spot. Also, I'm not confident that May's as good of a coach as people want to give him credit for. I think he. He got the payday, uh, and that's a, that's a whole different topic of debate. But yeah, I saw a few names. Uh, Matt wasn't Raheem one as well. Like there's 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 some big names. Amir Abdul Raheem of South Florida's name is being kicked yep. around for a couple of different jobs. I I just I don't know what Louisville ends up with. Do they get a name coach? Do they have to go the mid major route? I would be curious. Like uh, I would be curious. One that stands my mind and just showed that he's a really good coach is uh, Bucky at, at Sanford. I don't know if I've heard his name in any mix. So Bucky McMillan, right? Leaving, but he uh, he's a great coach. Like if you watch the schemes, even that he drew up in that Kansas game, I mean, they were getting good looks after good looks in that game. No, I, I, on that. I think yep, it's a, uh, oh, sorry, I think it's actually a, a great job still, TJ. I think the money and the resources and the support are all the way elite, and I think they're entitled to and should probably get a big name. I, I think they're think all, we, we, oh, You and I are sorry. just going to spar on this, and maybe it's my Memphis hatred for Louisville. It was maybe a great job three or four years ago when Chris Mack was first there. It ain't a great job right now. Kenny Payne was a disaster. Nobody knows if a year or two from now that the ACC doesn't disintegrate. There are lawsuits flying. I think that has people spooked. What do I know on how, I mean, what conference is Louisville going to be in at that point? If that That's starts true. to happen, who knows? Who knows? Uh, we'll see. Q Media has a vital question. It says, Corby and Matt, how did you do in Vegas profit-wise? Come on. Fess up. Uh, Q Media wants the, to know. On the tables, how did you do? Down, on the tables down. I had a uh, I had James Madison money line pretty big, and then I went to the uh, the roulette table and played <laughs> and played red After. three straight times and and lost. So uh, gave those profits away very quickly. So yeah, back oh. to you, Corby Craig, for the Savages. How did you end up in up or yeah. down in uh, Vegas? I had I had what you call the gambler's fallacy. Just the worst thing that can happen is the the first walk in of vegas I, I hopped on a craps table and ran insanely hot probably two hours of of did very well so uh first two hours did well took it went upstairs you know hung out and then the next three days proceeded to lose all of that plus some so the uh if you if we would ask me two hours in i would have been the happiest the guy axiom alive still remains the longer you stay and play the bigger trouble you're in because it's gonna catch Before up it to was you, fun right? It's fun. It That's what matters the most. That's what it's all. And you're intact. You boys are both intact. You're right here. Real quick, right. Richard watching. You talked about futures plays. There's not, I mean, there's not any real value on Houston or North Carolina. He's asking about it. Richard in the Q&A says, what about Houston or UNC futures? You would say not much value, right? Corey, you've been saying that whole show right now. Uh, do you have a, do you have a price? Usually like once you get to like futures are, are mostly priced and have value due to time horizon, like variables within. And uh, I mean, at this point, you're, you're basically taking all of them out. So if, even if you ask the day before March Madness, you you have so little variables that you can kind of price in the math pretty easy. I would assume not, because futures also usually have a 20% hold. I would assume no. Uh, I don't know the number in front of me, but I, I, would, I would guess there's not any value there. I'm looking for something on either one of those. I would have to believe they're like three to one or four to one. Also, right? if you want, if you want a future at this point and you want to skip Houston, the whole, Houston is actually I'm being told five to one, five to one right now on BetUS for what it's worth. Yeah, that's if you that, have, that, real quick. Sorry, that's to win the tournament, not the region. Just to make correct. Sure that's yes, VA. correct. Yes. If you want a future at this point, I think Matt would probably agree. If you want to skip the the hold, you can just do a running 
money line parlay. Like if you got Houston versus Duke, you're going to get what Houston four and a half. Play the money line there. Play the money line versus next, 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 and you'll probably get a better price right. than getting paid on the future wow. market right now. They're telling me off off uh, right now that the in the the North Carolina future is twelve hundred to win the national title. Interesting. If you played it right now in Bet US, and that may move down some as the as the, but you're being enticed. You're being enticed there for what it's worth on that. Uh, all right, boys, great stuff. Final thoughts here. Again, we don't have official plays yet, yet, peeps. There will be official plays coming tomorrow, Wednesday, et cetera, on the show in IT games as well. Final thoughts, Matt Cox, anything? Uh, I'm going to be dialed into my Chicago State Cougars. Chicago's <laughs> proud collegiate team uh, looking to keep it rolling, as after Corby said, the big one yesterday. Uh, it's the only team in this tournament. It's one of the only team I've seen in these kind of non NCAA tournaments that is truly all in. Haven't played for over a month. Um, from where they were two years ago to where they are now competing in postseason play is pretty crazy. They have a legit pro in Wesley Cardet. I will be betting on them, I believe. Here's uh I believe he, against Fairfield. So no line button. To a no line quartet button, but I like I like Chicago State here. Chicago State, a quartet of CBI games for Degenerate Monday on that. Corby Craig, final thought. Yeah, high point's been fun, but I, you know, you know me, I have to go root for my high point team. So I'll be on high point. Lord willing, no live button for me either. But a uh, high point, get it done versus Cleveland State team. <laughs> Listen, guys, great comments. Glad you're doing well. Fantastic stuff. Uh, thanks to Kevin and everybody behind the scenes. We're going to be back all week at 11 a.m. Eastern time until Friday, Saturday, 10 a.m. Eastern time. Plenty of time to go over the Sweet 16 and then eventually the Elite Eight. This time next week, we will know the Final Four. Hang in there with us. For Corby and Matt, I'm TJ. You've been watching the Bet US TV College Basketball Show. Thanks for joining in. Don't forget to like our video. If you don't want to miss our next show, make sure to ring our bell and subscribe. For all our sports content, head to BetUSTV.com. See you next time.